Good evening everyone, time for another silver update. This is the monthly chart of palladium provided by netdania.com. You can click on the link below. I wanted to show you this chart because it seems pretty relevant with the things that are going on with Russia and the United States and the importance of this metal as far as how much of it's produced in Russia. Now I drawn a couple of trend line, uh, not trend lines, I'm sorry, but uh, resistance lines here. And it looks like there's somewhat of a parallel going on here, although this seems to be a much larger move. You can see that what we had was a consolidation in this bull market. And then we had this breakout in 1999. And uh, you can see that was the beginning of a near tripling of the price of palladium. You can see that we've got another one forming here and we've got a blue candlestick where we've actually broken out above the resistance line and it really only leaves us if you look at the price history since this is a monthly there is really only one two three months where the, tri uh, the price is traded at a higher price than it currently is at right now and one of those months was a collapsing month so what type of move will we get from here if it is a mirror image of this well a tripling from here would give us about twenty seven hundred dollar twenty six hundred dollar an ounce for palladium so that could be crazy so let's look look over at the silver chart i want to put it down to about two hours because Actually, it's pulling out a little bit farther here. You can see that the pattern that I had pointed out, which was this rising pennant, that pattern was broken. Let's pull it back, actually, the one hour. That pattern was, was broken down, and it was a fairly clear breakout that we had. That pattern was broken down by the testimony and pre-testimony this is the pre-testimony in the middle of the night, as Andy Hoffman's pointed out, sell-off by the powers that be. And then this is the Yellen sell-off that I documented before. Now, this rally that we have here, this is the uh, shoot down of the Malaysian plane over the Ukraine. And so we're kind of in a sideways pattern here. It's turning into a sort of a larger pennant it still is kind of a pennant but it is more like a flag kind of so we'll have to wait and see how this resolves itself there seems to be kind of a battle now the volume has been fairly high as far as historical historically goes you can see that that buying was very large on the panic buying of the shoot down story um, then I point out these other spikes that we have um, these seem to be this definitely is big buying this is big buying and uh, this one's kind of neutral and that one's big buying so if these people stand for delivery we'll see what will happen let's look at gold real quick here Gold did not quite have the violent correction that silver did. So you can see the pennant's kind of broken, but it's very choppy here in the trading behavior. You can also see big increases here in volume. So gold is kind of corrected back to a base and seems to be rallying now. Now, the, the markets, let's jump over to the transportation index that's the one I really like to look at because that is the one that is kind of just gone crazy with the uh, activity and let's get the volume off here because it's irrelevant you can see the huge swings that we're having in this market and it looks to be setting up to try to do another move higher how high can a parabolic market go or is it parabolic yet um, it's if it's not parabolic yet it's getting close um, a move straight up maybe 
would would give us that parabolic I can't get that arrow there but a move straight up from here maybe up to 10,000 would pretty much be that parabolic move and then would normally resolve in a crash but who knows it's very clear that the powers that be have decided that they are going to enrich the investor and impoverish the worker that's clearly what is going on as the they drive the stock market up and bond markets up with printed money and uh, the prices of ordinary things go up but the wages that the people earn and the unemployment just doesn't get better so we all know who the federal reserve works for now i want to look at some stories here we're going to start off with this story that came out today about the resolution of an issue in this allen stanford ponzi scheme and i want to spend the rest of the time here addressing the issue of these fines that they have and uh, they're really just a, a racket really it's just a fine racket and I'll go into this and show you why but before we do this let's look at uh, the Stanford Ponzi scheme here in yet another blow to thousands of victims of the seven billion dollar Allen Stanford Ponzi scheme federal appeals panel in Washington has denied the SEC's bid to force the SIPC to help cover investor losses. SIP, industry-funded organization that insures securities in U.S. brokerage accounts for up to $500,000, denied coverage for Stanford investors early on. The group contends that because the losses were based on certificates of deposit issued by Stanford's offshore bank, which SIPC says are not securities, the investors do not qualify for coverage, and even if the CDs are securities, they are worthless. The SEC and Stanford investors contended that because the CDs were sold by a U.S. broker-dealer and because the losses were clearly the result of fraud, the investors should qualify for coverage. Under heavy pressure from members of Congress, the SEC went to court in 2011 to force the SIPC to pay. On Friday, a 23-page decision, a three-judge panel of the U.S. Circuit Court, U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia sided with SIPC. The opinion says under the law, Stanford investors were not customers of the U.S. broker-dealer, but rather lenders. <laughs> Sound familiar? To the Stanford Offshore Bank in Antigua. Here's more bail-ins. You're not an investor, you're a lender. The panel said it is truly sympathetic to the plight of the Stanford investors who are searching desperately for relief, but said the law sides with the SIPC. The head of the Stanford Victims Coalition said the group is obviously disappointed in the decision and called the SEC to appeal the ruling to the Supreme Court. In the meantime, Angela Shaw Coggett said the coalition will continue to pursue all options available for Stanford victims. Coggett also had harsh words for the SEC, which argued for the investors in the, this case, but missed the unfolding Stanford Ponzi scheme for decades. She said the agency bungled key legal issues in its appeal. It is mind-boggling the SEC has failed to provide adequate representation for the victims of a Ponzi scheme it stood on the sidelines and watched grow by billions of dollars over the course of a decade, she said. An SEC spokesman said the agency was reviewing the ruling. In a statement, SIPC President Stephen Harbeck lauded the decision but added, I want to underscore that SIPC has the deepest sympathy for the victims of the Stanford Antigua bank fraud, which caused them significant harm. Stanford's 18,000 U.S. victims have gotten little more than sympathy. Earlier this month, a federal judge approved a request by court-appointed receiver Ralph Janvey to distribute $17.8 million to the victims on top of $55 million Janvey began paying out last year, but the total losses to the U.S. investors are more than $5 billion, which works out to about one cent on the dollar.
The SEC shut down Stanford Financial Group in 2009, alleging its billionaire founder, R. Allen Stanford, was running a global Ponzi scheme to fund his lavish lifestyle. Stanford, 64, is serving a 110-year prison, uh, prison sentence at Federal Penitentiary in Florida. He's appealing his 2012 conviction on 13 criminal counts. So, Here's an example. Now, the first thing that's very interesting about this is that the SEC is suing the SIPC. And so it's the government suing the government to try to make the government pay, which is the taxpayer, pay for this fraud. But, and, of course, the representative of some of the investors uh, talked about the fact that the SEC let this fraud go on the whole time, and then they made a weak showing in their lawsuit. Perhaps they didn't want to win. And so, But the big question here is this. U.S. investors are out more than $5 billion. Now, this uh, distribution fund apparently is 55 million and 17 million, so what, 60, uh, 70 billion dollars or so out of uh, 5 billion. So what's that, 1%? The big question one would ask, and you can see here that uh, the money that was wasted by Stanford was uh, wasted to fund, they say here, his lavish lifestyle. Now, can anyone explain to me how you can spend $5 billion on a lavish lifestyle and none of that be recoverable? How can that money not be somewhere? That money's not in any accounts. That money, are, are we saying that he spent $5 billion on mansions and we can't seize those mansions and sell them and give some money to the investors? So we've got $5 billion that just seems to have disappeared. What do you want to bet that either the banks or the government have it? That's what I think. Now, let's look at another story here. These are a lot of stories that been have been hitting recently about these fines for the banks. And of course, the government gets to stand there and play the good guy by finding these banks. But is that really what's going on? Is it the good government that's keeping the banks in line? Or maybe is it something more like the government is getting their cut of the graft? Let's read this. UBS shares fall on Thursday following a research report which said the Swiss bank could have to pay $8 billion in fines and settlements relating to the alleged collusion and price manipulation in the global currency market. The report published on Wednesday by independent research firm Autonomous Research said foreign exchange settlements could cost banks a total of $35 billion, almost six times more than the total fines paid in the LIBOR interest rate rigging scandal. The report estimates that UBS will pay $8 billion, the biggest fine for any single bank, and more than the $6 billion total that all banks have shelled out for LIBOR. Next are the world's two largest foreign exchange trading banks, Deutsche Bank AG with an expected $4.4 billion fine and Citigroup with a $4.3 billion fine. And it goes on. Now, the question that I ask when I see these sorts of things is, where does this fine go? And how does that help anyone? If this bank committed a crime by swindling people or rigging things, then shouldn't the money of the fine they pay go to the people who were cheated? Well, let's look at this Wikipedia article on UBS. And I haven't investigated to find where all these fines went, but we get a hint of it here when we look at the fine that was paid by UBS on December 19th, 2012, UBS was fined $1.5 billion, and here's the explanation. $1.2 billion went to the U.S. Department of Justice and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and $160 million, or pounds actually, went to the UK Financial Services Authority. 
and 60 million Swiss francs went to the Swiss Financial Market Supervisory Authority. Don't see any investors there getting paid out money, but we see the governments of the world getting their payouts. Hmm, is it possible that maybe the banks and the government are in bed and this is the payoff that the banks have to pay to the government for their stealing? Now let's look at this history here. I think you'll find this fascinating. This is controversies, and this is under UBS. You could look up Deutsche Bank AG, you could look up JP Morgan, you could look up any of these criminal banks. And when you look at this list, there's no question that these are criminal banks. That's what they are. Look at the controversies. We've got the Mealy Affair. We've got tax evasion controversy. We've got the rogue trader scandal. We've got Lehman Brothers, municipal bond market rigging, 2011 Indian money laundering case, German tax investigation, LIBOR rigging, mortgage-backed securities rigging, French tax investigation, Belgian fraud investigation. So what we have here is a large group of criminal banks, criminal banksters, and what they do is they loot and steal until they've loot, looted and stolen so much that the government decides, well, it's time now to slap them on the wrist. And instead of the way they used to do it was they'd find them a little tiny amount that amounted to maybe one month's profits of their stealing and then they just go on and steal some more. Today we have a different situation. We have these fines that are being levied and then the government is taking a really big cut because we know that the governments are all bankrupt and so the banks steal and then they get to keep a percentage of it and then the then the government gets a percentage of that stolen money. And of course, the taxpayer has to pay for the whole thing. And none of the investors are ever made whole. Now, back to the story about Alan Stanford. We know that with the Oh, I can't remember the name of it, the recent one um, with the commodities. Uh, we've had a whole series of these. Never do we see the investors made whole. What we see is we see somebody go to prison and the money disappear or a tremendous amount of fines, which is paid to the government and the vest investors are sent walking without anything. It's absolutely insane that $5 billion can disappear and nobody can find it. It's pretty obvious to me that the bankers are knee deep and the government is knee deep in this whole mess. So there is just another reason why you cannot trust any of these financial institutions. And if you are expecting to get any kind of investment to pay off for you in the future, uh, you're not only relying on the solvency of the counterparty, whether that's an annuity, a 401k, a mutual fund, stocks, and we know with stocks are an incredible bubble. If everybody sells, there's no one to buy. All of these things, you're relying on the solvency of the counterparty and when it's found out that the counterparty is insolvent, uh, just as the case here with Stanford, and then they tried to get the SIPC to pay, which is, of course, one of those organizations, government organizations like the FDIC, that has got a fund to guarantee these things, they don't pay. It's just like the hurricane in 2004 that swept through and destroyed New Orleans, when the people came to collect on their insurance policies, the insurance companies would say, oh, no, your house wasn't destroyed by a hurricane. It was destroyed by a flood. 
so uh, you're not covered or whatever excuses they need to make. When the time comes and the money disappears, the people who guaranteed the money are going to tell you, sorry, you're not going to get any. That's the reason why we stack physical silver because when these fines are levied, they're given to the government and there isn't anything left for the investor. And we'll talk to you next time.